Today, I want to talk about the atonement. It's actually an extension of another conversation I've already had with Dr. David Allen, I think a leading scholar among uh, Southern Baptist traditionalists. He just produced uh, a, a, over 800 pages uh, uh, in a work called The Extent of the Atonement that you can find on Amazon. I highly recommend this book. Um, I also uh, recommend that you go back and listen to the podcast over the subject. Uh, it was just recently uh, released as well at Soteriology 101. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, James White, who I've had interactions with before, um, actually uh, responded to this podcast, and I wanted to give a visual presentation. Now, we may also do a podcast later on to answer some of the particular arguments, uh, depending on the scheduling and those kinds of things. But right now, I just want to take some time to answer I think just a, a basic misunderstanding and a, a perception issue, really. And I think this is a visually, uh, it's better visually understood than it is tried to be explained. And that has to do when, when we talk about uh, Calvinism versus non-Calvinism and we talk about the atonement, there's oftentimes a lot of debate. And there's a lot of intervarsity debate even among Calvinists as we talk about on the program as well. And Dr. White even acknowledges the fact that there are among Calvinists different opinions about how one looks at the atonement. He even challenges um, Dr. Bruce Ware to a debate over the subject of the atonement. And so proving that it is an intervarsity debate. And that's okay. I mean, we have intervarsity debates among traditionalists as well as Arminians. That's not, that's not unusual. That's not a big deal. But I think after listening to Dr. White and um, having my conversation with uh, Dr. Allen, I think there's just a one basic misunderstanding between Calvinists and non-Calvinists with regard to the atonement. In particular, one which Dr. White continually makes in our conversations is he continually accuses our view of election and atonement as being impersonal, um, a nameless, faceless group. He continually says things like that. And he sees his view of election and of atonement as being very personal and intimate. Um, and that's the way he likes to paint it. And truth be told, I mean, Calvinists do talk about, instead of limited, the, the word limited can have a negative connotation, so they'll oftentimes replace the word limited with the word particular um, or individualized. Well, one of the charges that oftentimes traditionalists, non-Calvinists, will bring to Calvinists is that as a Western culture, we tend to individualize things. We tend to think everything's about me, my, I, the individual. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons we think that this debate among uh, Calvinists and non-Calvinists doesn't really even exist within Eastern Orthodox because they don't think that way. They don't automatically read a text and think of it as about them, the individual, but instead see things as more uh, corporate or collectivist kind of a, a society, as the first century obviously would have been. So when a first century person would have read the word we or you, they wouldn't have thought we, the individuals, or you, the individuals. They would have thought we, the Jews, versus you, the Gentiles, the group. They thought more corporately. And therefore, the interpretation or the way you take a text is taken from a different perspective. Again, this is just a matter of fact. We're not, I'm not trying to um, say that one is necessarily right and one is necessarily wrong. Obviously, I believe the, the, the corporate view is the correct interpretation because I believe, as N.T. Wright argues and many others argue, that in the first century, that that's the way they would have read the text. That's the way Eastern Orthodoxy has typically read and understood the text, which is the reason the whole debate doesn't even hardly exist in that culture. And one of the reasons I think there's a lot of misunderstanding with regard to how we view the atonement in our discussions today. So I wanted to give a visual perspective of this and to help you to understand that our view of atonement is just as personal. Matter of fact, I would argue is more personal than Dr. White's view of limited atonement and particular redemption. And I think this visual illustration will help us to see that. Now, if you think of atonement as uh, indicated by a circle um, in, in this an analogy, is that the circle is covering the person that is atoned for. Within the particular Calvinistic redemption, you have individuals. So let's just put several individuals here to represent, and I'm no artist, which is why I stick to stick figures, because that's as good as it's going to get. And so you've got a plurality of people individually, and they need atonement. They need salvation. And so from a particular vantage point, from a Calvinistic, five-point Calvinistic vantage point, the concept of atonement is very particular, meaning individualized. It's what White would argue personal. 
and so it's about the individual. And so if someone's atoned for in eternity past, that God, eternity has selected somebody, then he has atoned for that individual. And so he's picked these individuals to atone for, not those individuals. So these people are born without the atonement in the sense that they have not been elected, they have not been eternally paid for, and they remain outside of the circle. They remain without atonement. And therefore, they will most certainly die in their sin. They're born helpless, they're born hopeless, and they have no help or hope. They have no opportunity even to respond to the gospel because they'll never want to because their nature is born such that they would never want to and God will never regenerate them and elect them and irresistibly call them to himself. They're the reprobates of the Calvinistic worldview. And so within the Calvinistic view of atonement, at least the high Calvinist five-point limited atonement Calvinist, which, again, Bruce Ware and others would reject as Calvinists. They reject the concept of particular redemption or, or um, limited atonement. And, and I think you'll see why. It's not a biblical concept, and we can argue that, of course, but more than well, welcome to have that theological discussion because it is a good theological discussion to have. But within James White's perspective, this does seem um, very personal. I mean, that's individual is circled there. And so that's a very personal kind of a thought process. And so from his perspective, he's saying, well, that's a personal thing. Yet that's being done according to the Calvinistic worldview before this, this individual, this person has a face or a name or anything about that person's even known or taken into account. Now, this is not to say that God doesn't already know this person or have the ability to fully uh, draw upon everything that he could know about this person is simply to say that according to the Calvinistic worldview of unconditional election, that God does not take into account anything about that person. His name, his face, his actions, his behaviors, his choices, his morality, um, his decisions, uh, his faith or his lack thereof. God doesn't take any account into any of those things as to whether he provides this atonement for this person. So I would argue that that's a lot more nameless and faithless than the our view of atonement, simply because we do believe that God takes into account this person's face, this person's name, this person's identity, this person's choices, this person's faith, this person's lack thereof. He takes into all of that in order to make his choice as to show favor, that God shows favor to the humble according to the scripture, that he looks upon um, those who of the contrite humble heart with favor that he chooses because he's merciful and because he's gracious, not because he has to. He chooses to show grace to the humble. And he personally is aware of and takes into consideration everything about that person. And so there's no nameless and faceless concept within our view of atonement. And so if this visually represents the Calvinistic particular redemption, limited atonement view as being very personal, the individual is being circled, the individual is being atoned for, it's particular and it's certain. Those two people um, within this group of five will most certainly be drawn irresistibly, saved, and atoned for. And it's very, it's very philosophically and very logically just plain and simple. God chooses certain individuals, he atones for those certain individuals, he irresistibly or effectually draws those individuals to himself, and he saves them. And it, it's a kind of nice little, nice little tidy system that sounds really good to a lot of people, and it fits within that tulip structure. But, unfortunately, as we argue in the podcast, there's never a passage of scripture that explains this in a clear and concise way in our estimation. Now, there are some passages which Dr. White and others go over, which, from their perspective, do argue for a particular redemption or an individual um, kind of perspective. Of course, there's answers to those, and there are exegetical commentaries from our perspective that answers John 10, for example, and other passages from our perspective. Um, and to ignore that is just not being intellectually honest and consistent with how you do real debate and real discussion, to take into consideration that both sides have ample exegetical commentary on every single one of these texts, and you can't ignore or avoid that or accuse the other side of not ever providing that. Um, the, Dr. Allen provides exegetical commentary on all the texts within his book, um, and uh, as well as in other articles and works that he's done. Um, we've provided that through countless numbers of resources um, that you could you could find online with a simple search. So the accusations that sometimes White and others will make that the traditionalists or the non-Calvinists don't have exegetical commentary on those passages, um, that's just not being intellectually honest or fair to, to represent the other side. I would never say that of, of Calvinists. I would never say they don't have um, uh, exegetical uh, 
you know, explanations for different texts to try to explain their viewpoint. Now, I would argue, as I think Dr. Allen rightly argues, is that there are no texts that specifically say what the Calvinists attempt to argue from the text. And of course, that's a debate to be, to be had. So how would you visually represent the same thing from our perspective? Well, first and foremost, you would take out this concept of the atonement as being individualized, like the hyper individualization of Western culture. And you would say instead that there is an atonement that is provided for all. Now right here, this is a gate. And I'm borrowing the gate analogy from Scripture itself. Matter of fact, the Bible refers to Christ as the door or the gate by which we may enter. And so we'll put Christ right here as representing this gate that is open and by which anyone can enter in to this realm of being atoned. That Christ is the elect one and that whosoever believes in him, whoever is in him, as, first, uh, as, as, excuse me, Ephesians, as Ephesians chapter 1 teaches, that one becomes in him, not in eternity past, individualistically, as the Calvinist would assume. But according to verse 13, that whoever hears the word of truth and believes is marked in him. And so you're not marked in him until you hear the word of truth and until you place your faith in him. And then you enter in through the gate. And so this individual can enter in through faith into Christ. Now, this is vitally important to understand because this, in, this person is still an individual. A lot of people see the corporate view and they say, oh, well, you're not, you're not including individuals. You're not talking about individuals. There's an individual. He has a face. <laughs> he has a name. Okay, this is, this is John here. <laughs> see, he has a name. He has a face. We're still talking about individuals. We're just talking about individuals who have responsibility. They have the responsibility to confess their sin, to humble themselves and confess. And through, through Christ, they may enter into the provision of the atonement. That atonement is provided for all of these up here, and that God genuinely wants every single one of these to enter in through Christ so as to be atoned for. And if any of them don't enter in, it's their own fault. It's not because God rejected them before the foundation of the world. It's because they rejected God. No one can say on the final day of judgment, I hated God because he first hated me. I rejected God because he first rejected me. I didn't receive the gift of atonement because he didn't provide it for me. No one can say that. The gift of atonement is provided for the whole. It's provided for all. And so whosoever believes in him, in Christ, may enter in. And that's not a nameless, faceless person. That person is known. So this person, John, who has a name, who has a face, this person comes to Christ with his baggage. He comes with his pornography addiction, with his murder, with his adultery, with his most heinous sins that you could possibly imagine, sins that we see even um, leaders within the scripture commit like David did with Bathsheba. We see these, these persons doing horrible things and yet coming to Christ in Christ in full view of everything that they've done, in full view of their sin and their wretchedness, in full view of their pigsty, in full view of their name and their face. They're not nameless and faceless. Christ chooses, not because he has to, but because he wants to, because he's gracious. He chooses to forgive. Now, because John asks for forgiveness, does that mean that John deserves to be forgiven? Does that mean that John has earned his forgiveness? Of course not. If that were the case, there wouldn't be any reason for the cross. The reason the cross had to be there is to pay the debt for John, because John can be as sorry and humble and repentant as he wants to. His debt has to still be paid. If Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness, then there would have been no need for the cross if that had merited his salvation because God could have just said, oh, Abraham, you believed, you confessed, therefore you have earned your way into heaven. That's just not the way it works. Abraham, even a believer, even one faithful to God, had to have the atonement. He had to have his debt paid for, which is why Christ still had to come and die. And so this concept or idea that decisions or belief or confession earn or merit salvation, even if done freely, is just a farce. It's a misrepresentation of our, our, our concept of salvation. You don't earn or merit salvation through faith and belief and decisions. Christ pays for your sin. He pays the debt. 
And God, because he's gracious, chooses to show mercy to whomever he wants to. Well, we don't have to guess who he wants to show mercy to. The Bible tells us who he wants to show mercy to. He chooses to show mercy to those who humble themselves and confess in faith, who place their trust in Christ. So when one, any one of these people, place their faith in Christ, they enter into the provision of atonement. Jesus Christ gives a perfect example of atonement by referring to the serpent that was listed in the desert. The serpent was lifted in the desert as a provision for the whole, not for any one individual. It was provision for the whole. And therefore, if anyone was bitten by a snake and they looked to the serpent, the provision for healing, they would be healed. Now, if someone were to have been bitten by a snake in that time, and let's say they were a mile or two away uh, on the other side of the mountain from where the serpent was lifted up on the pole. And they said, well, you know, that's just a bunch of superstition. I don't believe in that stuff. If this snake's going to kill me, it's going to kill me. Whatever. I'm just not going to go. I'm not going to look to the serpent. I just don't believe. And he dies. And he goes up to the pearly gates. And he says, well, hey, God, um, I, thought, I thought you were going to provide for it. I thought you were going to provide healing for us. Jesus could honestly say to this person, I did provide healing for you. I provided the means through which you would be healed. Yes, you died of snake venom, but you died because you refused. Ultimately, you refused to look to the serpent to be healed. The provision was made for you. In other words, there is the provision of healing here. You, if you walk this way instead of towards Christ, that's his own fault. It's not because God rejected him before the foundation of the world. That's his own doing meaning that he had the ability to do otherwise. He had the ability to come to Christ. And therefore, his walking away is totally his doing, not God's. It's, this is not God's choosing to reject him before the foundation of the world. The atonement is provided, and the gate, the way in, is through Christ. This goes to John chapter 10, which Dr. White spends quite a bit of time on. And the understanding from John chapter 10, from our perspective, is the sheep being referred to in John chapter 10, there's two folds of sheep. If you go on to read through chapter 10, which he does not go on to read through the whole context of chapter 10, he talks about two folds of sheep. The first fold, we believe, is referencing to his apostles, the original um, 12 who are brought in because Christ comes to the earth, not revealing himself to everyone, not showing himself to everyone. Matter of fact, as we read throughout the context of the, 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 the narrative of the New Testament, Jesus isn't revealing his identity to everyone at the time when he comes on earth to earth, down from heaven. He's only revealing himself to a select few. He even speaks to parables to those on the outside so that they don't understand, so as to keep them in the dark. He doesn't want everyone to understand he's the Christ. Otherwise, they wouldn't crucify him and he wouldn't accomplish his purpose. Even Paul points us out that these things are mystery that's been hidden for generations. If they had understood them, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through following. And I think this is very important to understand. That's the context of the New Testament, is that Jesus is only revealing himself to those the Father has given him while down from heaven. That's reference to the apostles and those closest to them, that God is entrusting the truth to them. He's explaining the parables to them, but he's not entrusting it to all the Jews at the time. Now, the, the Gentiles haven't even been included in that context. It's not until Peter has that sheet with a white, sh you know, the white, the dream with the white sheet let, let down with Cornelius and that whole interaction, and Paul is called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. That's when the Gentiles are brought in. And so the second fold being spoke, spoken of in John chapter 10, the context is, this is the first fold I'm going to bring in. And I'm going to convince them through miracles and signs and wonders. I'm going to show these people who I really am. Walk on water, heal the blind, raise the dead right in front of them. And I'm going to teach them these truths. And those on the outside, I'm going to speak to in parables to keep them at you know, arm's length until it's the right time. John, like Mark 9, 9 says, they just came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and he says, don't tell anybody who I am until I've ascended into heaven. It's not until he's raised up that he draws all men to himself. Well, how does he do that? He sends the gospel. The gospel is the power of God into salvation, and it's not until he's raised up that he commissions the gospel to go into all the world so as to draw all peoples to himself, both Jew and Gentile. And he does that through sending of the gospel, which is not being completed in John chapter 10 or John chapter 6, where the context is that God is only revealing himself to a select few and only bringing in to the fold those the Father have given him. And he has revealed himself only to them uniquely and keeping everyone else out for a redemptive plan and purpose. 
That's the context of John chapter 10 from our perspective. James White doesn't take the time to lay out that perspective or to explain that perspective and then answer it. He just assumes we never deal with it or just makes a kind of a blanket statement like we've just never exegetically commented or talked about our perspective of John 10 or John 6 or those kinds of passages. And again, that's just not being intellectually honest with this discussion. And I, I want us to be intellectually honest with this and to confront both perspectives, try to do so fairly. From our perspective, it is just as much about individuals. These are all individuals. God knows their names. He knows their faces. He knows everything about them. And if they respond by looking to the serpent lifted on the pole or looking to Christ in faith, then they will enter in him. And in him, they have all the benefits of the atonement. They have the benefits of what salvation is all about. And God has predestined. He has guaranteed, according to Ephesians chapter uh, 1, verse 13 and 14, and he has marked them in him, giving them the guarantee of the Holy Spirit to indwell them, thus guaranteeing that they will be saved. That's the hope that we have, that the hope of adoption, that we eagerly await for our adoption, as Romans chapter 8 teaches, that we openly await for that adoption and we eagerly await for that to come because we know God has predestined us to adoption. And we wait for that adoption because those who are in Christ, though they have been predestined to be adopted. One of the best illustrations that I've used before to help people to understand this concept of atonement and election and salvation. Um, Dr. White seems to accuse traditionalists of not having a doctrine of election. We have a very robust theological doctrine of election. Um, and it's better illustrated in the way that we've talked about before with an airplane, for example, that is predestined tomorrow at noon to go from Dallas to Chicago. Well, that airplane can be predestined, and whoever's on that airplane can be predestined. Its destination can be predestined. But it's not necessary that God has, or the pilot in the, in, the, in the scenario, has predestined who will and will not get on that airplane. He can say, everyone and anyone is welcome onto this plane, but what has been predestined is your final destination. In other words, whoever is in Christ has been predestined to be made holy and blameless, that's sanctification. He's been predestined to adoption. That's a part of the redemption of our bodies. It's something that we're eagerly awaiting for. That whoever's on that plane has been predestined to an end. Well, whoever's in Christ coming through the gate, whoever's in him, it has been predestined for you to become holy and blameless, to be sanctified. It's been predestined for you to be justified. It's predestined for you to be glorified. God has predetermined that whoever, whatever individual, again, it's not removing individuals, Whatever individual places their faith in Christ, who confesses their sins, who humbles themselves, they will be redeemed. This is essential because otherwise you totally remove and undermine the responsibility of this individual for either entering in through Christ or rejecting Christ because ultimately he's doing exactly, within the Calvinistic worldview, exactly what God has created him to do. He's rejecting Christ because he wants to reject Christ because God ultimately decreed for him to want to reject Christ and he has no opportunity or no desire to do otherwise because he has been de decreed not to want to do otherwise and he can't come to Christ. So in my estimation, these people who walk away from Christ, they have the perfect excuse for doing so. What better excuse is there in the world for the reprobate of the Calvinistic system to be able to say, I rejected God because he first rejected me. I didn't um, come to Christ because he didn't atone for me. He didn't provide the individualized atonement for me, so no wonder I rejected him. That gives an excuse that the Bible simply never gives. It's a, it's a view of atonement that simply does not have the support that men like Dr. White and others, I think well intending, just simply misunderstand the concepts of atonement and election as being, yes, very personal. Matter of fact, much more personal than their view of atonement and election in my estimation. Hopefully this has been a good visual picture and understanding of the atonement from a traditionalist perspective. Thanks for watching.